Frankfurt because I'm not a Marxist scholar. I don't see myself as one. I have spent the last uh, 45 years or so interviewing lots of workers and interviewing lots of managers and attending a lot of trade union meetings and women's group meetings and just trying to make sense of capitalism and its incredible persistence and its refusal to implode when people think it's going to implode. And, um, and so I use Marx as a kind of like a user's handbook that I go to when I'm stuck to try to understand what on earth is going on. And I have never had the luxury of being able to sort of sit and read and take notes and reflect and, you know, it's... It, um, and so, um, as I say, I, I'm not merely the scholar of Marx that many people in this room are. But what I, what I really want to share with you is, is the kind of some of the sense that Marx has helped me make of, of the world that we're living in and the changes that we have seen over the last uh, half a century or so in terms of, of, of this incredibly conflicted and horrible uh, knot, which is the relationship between labor and capital. Well, you know, capitalism is a relationship, but I don't see it as capitalism here and labor there opposed to each other, but, but a knot that, that, where they're intricately tied to each other. And um, um, I think the household is quite an interesting place to look at. I mean, Marx doesn't like have a chapter called the household in capital. But the household brings together so many different dimensions of Marxist theory. I'm increasingly coming to the conclusion that we actually can't understand how capitalism grows of course it has to grow, it has, it, 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 in the nature of capitalism, it has to grow almost exponentially all the time, spread into new areas of life, it, intensify the exploitation of labor. We really can't understand this without understanding the household. So what is the household in Marx? First of all, it's the place where social reproduction takes place, uh, and, social and cultural reproduction not just having the babies, but you know, to singing to them and teaching them to speak, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, it's also the place where the reproduction of labor power takes place, and Marx is very clear that that is something different. That the, the, the labor power is in itself a commodity that belongs to the worker, that the worker, who in Marx is seen as a he, um, produces himself, and it also has to be, so to speak, reproduced and maintained. Um, it's also a place where consumption takes place. It's also a place where production itself sometimes takes place, by which I mean production for the market, not just production for the use of the household. And um, it's also a site of primitive accumulation. And it is all these things mixed up with each other in very complex ways, and that produces, uh, there, you know, there are a whole lot of aspects of that which Marx doesn't really uh, develop, which give us some problems. Oh, finally, of course, it has its own internal social relationship. And I'm not just here talking about familial relationships and uh, relationship, but, you know, uh, parental relationships and sexual relationships of which are of course there, but it's also a place where paid labor takes place. Uh, you know, and Marx's household itself was a very interesting case study in the extremely complex uh, a play of, of subordination and domination and solidarity and support and, and complicated labor relations, both paid and unpaid, involving sex <laughs> and social domination. You know, Marx's household itself is, is if you like, a study in, in the complexity of, of, of the relationships that take place within a household. Um, but we also have some other contradictions. Workers enter the labor market and create value as individuals. You know, the, 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 the theory, labor theory of value sort of sees the individual worker out there working X number of hours, of which, you know, X number for his own subsistence, and, um, and um, the other proportion, of course, is taken by the capitalists. Um, but the subsistence takes place in a household, typically with other members in it, 
so there's the question, is it the subsistence of that worker or the subsistence of the whole household? And there are debates about that. And it's clear that Marx was well aware of child labour, because you go to the last chapters of Capital Volume 1, and it's absolutely full of all this stuff about child labour, women's labour, and you know, the, all that stuff about the extra hour and the children being exploited in the fact. So he was well aware of child labour and women's labour. And this sort of conundrum of the relationship between the labour and the, of the children and the and, and the wife and the labour of, of the husband and it's not at all well developed in Marx. We have to go later to the economic writings, uh, which is I think Engels speaking actually, where he actually um, rather chillingly spells it out that uh, when uh, you know the, the, the worker puts his wife and children to work in the factory, he's like a slave owner who owns the, their labour power, which is the commodity. Of, of, the, of the women's and the children's labour. Um, I, I think this is Engels speaking because we get the same story in the origins of the family and you know all that stuff. Um, so, but I mean that, that is, actually isn't developed. It's so the problem of you know whose subsistence are we talking about um, and the differences in subsistence levels is kind of dealt with at the abstract level with this concept of the average value of labour. But that seems to be like a bit of a fudge, actually. It seems to be like saying, okay, there's this problem. Let's, you know, this will do for the time being. Let's put it on one side and not think too much about that. Let, let's kind of move on. But it seems to me that this is particularly a problem now when we're talking about global labor markets and a global reserve army of labor um, is, is how we actually make sense of that particular. I don't want to talk about that today, but I just want to sort of plonk it there as a problem. Um, and another uh, uh, real issue, it seems to me, is that Marx talks about the worker as the owner of his own labour power, um, which is a commodity, but um, if he is producing his labour power as a commodity, but that reproduction of his labour power requires the labour of, uh, uh, of other household members to help produce it, then we have another problem about what, you know, are we back to this question of, of, of the wives and the children as the slave? Or, you know, there's a whole bundle of really not very well addressed issues of, around that, which again, I want to sort of park on one side, but I think we have to think quite seriously about them. Um, I'm now going to move on to, uh, I'm sorry, I, I go into the diagrams because my simple brain, it helps me <laughs> make sense of things. This is a diagram some of you may have seen because it appears in my most recent book and I think I first presented it here in Toronto at a workshop that Leo Panich organised, the uh, Socialist Register workshop. Uh, and it's caused some controversy but I will put it here together because I think we have to look at this thorny question of productive and unproductive labour, which caused so much fuss in the 1970s. It, it, the, the concept of unproductive labour was terribly disliked by a lot of feminists, and also by a lot of public sector workers, I may say, also, uh, during the 70s. And I think it's, uh, we need to unpack it a little bit. And uh, first of all, let's not call it unproductive. Let's call it reproductive. That's not contradicting Marx, because Marx recognized that this kind of labor produced use values. It is, in fact, the labor that is uh, producing use values for, for the whole of society and, and for capitalism as a well, whole as well, actually, in, you know, in terms of social reproduction and so on. But I think it's very dangerous to just see that as a single thing, because it, it is dynamically divided between there is uh, unpaid reproductive labour and there is paid reproductive labour. And there is a dynamically changing relationship between the two. And um, what we have now, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later, we have in this bottom red, the bottom left-hand corner, we have, this is, this is, by the way, this is a typology of labour, it's not a typology of workers. Uh, it, it's perfectly possible for one worker to uh, take part in all four, sorry, it's the purple one I was talking about, is being the productive labour. Um, it's, uh, it, I mean, most of us do work in at least three of these categories, and some people carry out labour in all four of these categories. It's the purple one, the one that says commodity production, which is the one that produces surplus value, uh, which is at the centre of this 
conflicted relationship between labor and capital. But of course, the, the, the the, the total sort of, so to speak, pool of labor in that category is constantly being augmented because the reproductive labor is, is, is constantly being commodified. New kinds of commodity are being created and labor that previously was, was unproductive, reproductive, is now being dragged into the sphere of productive labor, of commodity production. Now we also have this problematic category down in the bottom right hand corner which I call consumption work which I think is very important to separate from other kinds of unpaid work I'm not paying me some people say that I say consumption work creates surplus but it does, I don't believe it does I think it's only paid productive labor that does that but consumption work ca carries out a different role in relation to commodity production under capitalism than the, the labor that is just involved in social reproduction and the reproduction of labor power. Because what it does is by allow, companies externalize labor onto consumers that previously was carried out by paid labor. And in so doing, uh, the, um, the exploitation of the paid labor is intensified. So consumption labor plays the role of intensifying uh, the extraction of surplus value from paid labor in production activities. Now, um, so, so that's sort of this diagram, if you like. Now, what I want to talk about uh, a little bit in using a slightly different kind of dialogue, uh, diagram with even more lurid colors, which I, uh, I blame Microsoft for, um, <laughs> is, um, is I now want to talk about the very, very dynamic changes in labor between these categories, which, uh, which can illustrate how the commodification process takes place and how the intensification of the extraction of surplus value from paid workers in commodity production is achieved, uh, in my view. And the household plays an absolutely critical role in all that. First of all, we have the unpaid labor involved in social and cultural reproduction. Uh, these are the kind of categories of labor. Then we have the paid private work, um, which is like the work done by domestic servants in the, in the 19th century, which Marx argued was, was, was not uh, productive labor because it was paid for out of the, the wages of the paid workers. It wasn't uh, directly producing surplus value. A uh, paid private service work uh, either carried out in, in like in farms or, or whatever, or in households, which I may say is greatly on the increase right now because of, through migration and so on, and, uh, and through the pressure on women in developed countries to enter the labour force, there's a huge growth in. Uh, there's a kind of new servant class made up of mainly of migrant workers working in the homes uh, of, of uh, not of bourgeois families, but of, you know just of labour aristocracy, you could say, um, households in the developed world. We then have, um, of course, the classic uh, industries. Uh, this, is, this is productive work in Marxist sense, uh, um, it involved in the, the production of physical commodities. Uh, we also have uh, paid work in public services, which is another you know, category of um, reproductive labor, not producing surplus value. We have paid work in private sector companies as opposed to households, or well, profit-making private companies providing services. And then we have this unpaid labor in the home and the, consumer, uh, the community which is involved in, in the consumption. <coughs> and um, those categories might look rather sort of bland. But what, what I want to talk about is the very dynamic shifts between them. Um, the first shift, I mean historically probably the first, is the, um, the, the driven by social inequalities, driven by the need for one lot of women to enter the workforce, we have uh, this growth of private, uh, of, of paid labor in other people's homes and households, like servant labor. Uh, the development of private services um, transforms that kind of labor, especially for working class households, 
into not individually provided private services in the home, but a services provided by companies, whether it's cleaning companies, retail companies, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, um, driven by urbanization, driven by proletarianization, people moving to cities without access to the uh, kind of social support they had in the countryside, etc., etc. So there's this historical growth of service companies. Uh, we also have, in the, especially in the mid 20th century, the development of welfare states, which creates new kind of reproductive labour in public services. Um, that now, now, let's put technology in the picture. <laughs> technology transforms services into goods. If, instead of having the laundry, you have the washing machine and the, the washing powder, etc. Um, so each wave of uh, each financial crisis, economic crisis, is followed by like 1929, like 1973, like 2007, whatever. It's followed by a major restructuring of capital, capitalism, which typically involves a big investment in new machinery to, you know, uh, uh, haul uh, some companies out of from. Uh, uh, back into profit, profitability, and that a, a part of that process involves the transformation, that the creation of new uh, physical commodities, which uh, which are have their basis in activities that previously were services, uh, very often household services. In the, uh, you know, in the 1930s, it was electrical goods like washing machines and vacuum cleaners and so on, um, and. Um, then um, the uh, having all these machines instead of services creates in turn new kinds of consumption work. Households buy ready meals instead of cooking them. They you know pile up their own goods in the in the supermarket instead of having them delivered. They uh, buy their washing machine online, they buy their flat pack, whatever. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a new interaction between the companies that are making the physical goods and the consumption work with a constant <coughs> right to externalise as much labour as possible onto the consumer in the interests of ratcheting up you know, the productivity of the production workers. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the growth of self-service, uh, etc. So this production, uh, this consumption work, it, it, it grows as, as capitalism grows, but it's unpaid labour, but it's, its function, is, it seems to me, should not be confused <coughs> with the function of, if you like, simple reproductive labour. But neither should it be confused with the, the uh, production of, you know, of surplus value in commodity production. And then we have other enormous shifts going on. You have the outsourcing by manufacturing companies and business services, the growth of enormous new uh, bits of capitalism that are to do with the supply of outsourced services uh, of a whole variety, um, uh, not just to the private sector, but also to the public sector. So we've been seeing, particularly now, this massive commodification of, of, of public services are transforming those forms of, of labour into, uh, you know, putting them inside capitalism in, 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 in the direct way that um, means that the, 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 the workers are directly exploited by capitalists in the way that uh, they were not in the past. Um, and um, then, of course, we have other dimensions going on. We have austerity also, uh, you know, reducing public services and putting unpaid work back into the home for a lot of people. And, um, and now the growth, what I happen to be doing research on right now, is the growth, the, the, the exponential growth of these online platforms for managing work, which we can understand um, uh, partly as this. The bringing of a whole lot of informal activities that were carried out in the informal economy, in people's households, you know, window cleaning and cleaning and babysitting and walking the dog, etc. Bringing all those activities within the, the discipline and the scope of global companies that um, tailorize the work, but, but are directly 
um, control the workers, transform the nature of the work, and bring it within the scope of, of capitalist relations. Uh, initially, uh, very often in the form of taking a rent, uh, but, that, but as the sector develops, it's changing very fast, increasingly this tendency of uh, replacing uh, goods for services take place. Uber is investing in self-driving cars, for instance, just as an example. Um, so, uh, so we have this um, other dynamic. So, in other words, we, we have... Um, uh, yeah, sorry, no, next step, before I reach my conclusion. Um, the, the, um, this is also accompanied by an, a massive new growth of physical goods. People are often, there's a whole lot of rhetoric around like that, but you know, you know, robots are going to, you know, <laughs> take all the jobs. <laughs> I mean, really, uh, this, this, I mean, just, just think, think of the business model for the capitalist. The, the first capitalists that introduced robots, great, they have a competitive advantage over the other. We have to always remember that capitalism isn't one big thing, it's a lot of different capitalists competing with each other, right? You know, Marx is very clear about that. Um, but, but, you know, the first company might make a killing with its robots, but then once the, once the robots have become a generalised commodity that's available to everybody, and every factory has got the robots, what an earth kind of a capitalist business model can make any kind of a profit whatsoever, <laughs> buying them at the market value, <laughs> making standard goods that are sold at the market value. I mean, Marx at least teaches us, you know, to, to take that, um, you know, <laughs> To, to take that seriously. And of course somebody has to make all these 3D printers and robots and um, drones and you know all these other technologies. So they, they take up raw material, they, they like labor, and, they, and as, as quickly as they become standardized, somebody has to develop a new one. You know? Think how often you have to buy a new mobile phone or hearing aids or whatever. Anyway, um, but, but so, so what we're seeing right now in the, in the recovery, capitalism's very successful recovery, after the financial crisis, at the expense of workers globally, is, is a whole huge new sector growing, um, manufacturing sectors as well as service industries. Um, so um, I, I, I'm really aware of, of the pressure of time here. So I'm just going to end with. I mean, I could elaborate on lots of these things, but I won't. Some of the underexplored questions that I think. Marx, I mean, you, some, a lot of you have read up Marx much more carefully than me, and maybe the answers are there, but I haven't found them yet, so uh, search as I, as I do. Some of the unexplored questions that I think we really need to, somebody, somebody needs, you know, have we got any potential PhD students here? Somebody really needs to do some research on this stuff. Uh, one is the critical importance of, of logistics work. As value chains get longer and longer and longer, the gap between value creation and value realization gets longer. We're in volume two, capital volume two territory here, but, but it's still not really well developed. So, and, and that's where capitalists, capitalists take their risk in that gap between value creation and realization. It might never be realized, you know. The container ship might, you know, not dock. The Amazon warehouse might go on fire. The, uh, some a Chinese imitator brings out a better iPhone, and nobody wants to buy yours. You know, there are all kinds of reasons why that value may never be realised in all these millions of commodities. And and this, of course, puts enormous pressure on logistics workers. And the household is the last step in that logistics value chain. The more that the, they can persuade you to get, pick up your own Amazon purchase from a local depot instead of having it delivered to your home, you know, the better it is for the companies. Uh, so there are huge, there's contestation all along the value chain of who controls which bit of it, um, who grabs what slice of the rent, both in the physical labor, uh, although the, I mean, so the, the, those workers are, are suffering more than almost any other workers in the world right now, whether it's the cycle careers at one end or the guys on the container ships, you know, or the, um, the, 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 sque the time squeeze on those workers is, is, is unbelievable. But it's inextricably linked with the labor uh, of, of the household in, in purchasing it. And I think we really need to a much better understanding 
of the process of value realization. Um, uh, so I think that's one very important issue. Um, uh, I think we also need a much more sophisticated analysis of the, the dynamics of decommodification and recommodification of public services, which, which is so complex now with all these different models of um, it's kind of semi-privatizations with outsourced companies taking rents from the state and, um, you know, the, the implications of that for social, uh, social reproduction, I think, are very need to be looked at. I think the concept of the reserve army, Marx's concept, you know, it makes a lot of sense in a, in a spatially, in the kind of spatially bounded labor markets that he was mainly writing about. But when we have a global reserve army, uh, either access through offshoring the work or through bringing the workers to the job through migration. Um, there's a complex interaction between sending the jobs to the people and bringing the people to the job, so to speak. And uh, I think the cons, uh, especially given those problems I talked about earlier, of actually, how, you know, whose subsistence are you talking about? You know, when you're talking about the labor theory of value. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done there, theoretically. Um, I think there are all kinds of new forms of wrench that need to be investigated. Uh, I mean, a lot of the biggest corporations in the world, are basically they have a rental, like companies like Microsoft, you know, or Google. Their business model is not based primarily on selling commodities, it's based on rent, and we have to, think that through in terms of, you know, I, I mean, I, I, one of the things on my wish list is rereading the whole of volume two of Capital and trying to make sense of that. Um, oops, and finally, it's my last point, I think, waste. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, I don't know if you could talk about, like, negative use values, but um, as soon as the value is realized as far as, you know, uh, in, in this complex, value chains of, of capitalism, as soon as you bought the, the iPhone or the pair of shoes or whatever it is, a refrigerator, it, it's of no interest to capital whatsoever what happens to it then, whether you use it or not or whatever, but it remains there as detritus, which has to be disposed of in some way. Um, and, uh, and there, there, are, there is labor involved in uh, the processing of, of this terrible detritus and couple of So I think we need a, for like a political economy of waste. I know some people have done work on this, but I think more needs to be done. And that's it. I'll stop. Thank you.